reflection on digitalization. So it's not the classroom perspective that you get here. It's the perspective of institutional leadership and institutional support and uh, transformation on digitally enhanced learning. And one of the activities of this project that is funded by uh, the Erasmus program is a survey on digitally enhanced learning and teaching in European higher education institutions. And I have actually put up one of the questions that we also had in the survey as a poll here. And many of you have already answered to that. So I just leave that open for a couple of seconds and maybe I run a second poll then. We will share the results with you later. Um, what the survey has been doing in the period from March to June, so right when the COVID crisis uh, took up, we conducted uh, via a survey to institutional leadership data across Europe on the state of play and the perspectives for digitally enhanced learning. We had more than 300 responses, um, fairly good dissemination, uh, 48 countries, so it's the entire European higher education area. And uh, responses also come from different types of institutions. So we have technical colleges, art schools, online universities, but mainly they are, I would say, conventional universities. And as we conducted already a similar survey in 2014, we are also able to show some longitudinal data. The report will be launched in mid-November this year, we hope. Um, and will be widely disseminated, so you will have access to that. But some of the um, emerging data we will show you already here today. So I just take the moment, I close the poll now, but I also try to launch a second poll. No, I can't do that for whatever reasons. Good, right, one moment. So we had the one poll on the enablers and we have a second poll now on the disablers. And I hope you can see that while I continue to, to run the slides. Let's see if that works. Um, so, so much as an introduction to the survey, we will uh, try to look on three things here. One is the state of play of the institutions and we asked them really to report the situation that they had before the crisis. Um, we gave them some extra questions where they uh, uh, commented on their uh, actions during uh, and in response to the crisis. We will discuss a little bit about the enabling, enablers and barriers. So that's the ports that you're currently filling and how to move forward, how to get uh, beyond them. Um, and then we will also have a bit of an outlook on Corona and beyond uh, what this new normal could actually be. And um, here is the first uh, finding that we wanted to share. It's the moods of delivery that we see throughout Europe. So this is uh, what you can see. 75% of institutions are, are currently offering blended learning either throughout the institution or in some faculties. We haven't seen a major increase here compared to 2014, but we would say it's really the predominant and ongoing trend. Everybody agrees to that. The question is then um, to understand better what this blended learning actually is. What is uh, also not entirely new, but where we think to have seen a quite an increase is uh, short non-degree online courses. So micro-credentials, as you would call them probably, or just certificates. Um, this is interesting because it turned out to be uh, the most frequent type of online provision. Um, so that's what, if, if there's a pure online uh, uh, course, then it's usually a micro-credentials. And what was also interesting that institutions, unlike full online degrees, they do not only have one or two of them, but some of them had dozen, a dozen or even more. Um, what is important here that they are not only delivered online, but even more so in blended or in conventional mood. So online, yes, uh, but many more actually blended and conventional. And they also seem to have a clear target. This is about lifelong learning and professional development. I think that's an interesting finding also in a time um, when you can clearly see a, a strong European policy interest into these courses.
On the fully online degrees, we can't see a major increase there. It's more or less the same uh, 35, 38% that we had in 2014. But what is interesting, this time we looked more on regional data and we found major differences. Uh, so some regions I put out here, Northern Europe, uh, where it is actually offered by 60% of the institutions. And then we asked for the first time also about virtual mobility. And as you see, it's about one quarter of the institutions that offer that currently. That will be interesting to see also as currently it, it's actually uh, a replacement of uh, physical, or it might be a replacement of physical mobility, given the situation that we are all in still at the moment. But in the future, of course, we hope that it is not replacing uh, physical mobility, but this, this becomes an, a, an additional opportunity for international exchange and mobility. I stop here for a moment and ask Mark. Mark, do you recognize that from the perspective of your institution? Yes, I think uh, the particular standout for me is the growing trend to blended education. Um, and I've actually just posted a link there um, to something we're doing right now on blended education. But um, I've also, in case you want to mine through and have a look at the results of the 2014 survey, you'll see I put the link into that in the chat box. Thanks. Um, the one thing I would say that I, I think a survey like this is challenging to probe deeper and it's an unanswered question for us when we talk about blended education is to what extent institutions are using this as a strategy to disrupt the nature of the curriculum, to enhance and really infuse the digital experience in teaching and learning as distinct from just blending in a very comfortable um, and light or weak way. Um, so the word blending itself um, was challenging for us to know how we might define that. And we know that different institutions define it quite differently. It's, of course, taken on a completely new meaning, along with other terms like hybrid, uh, post or since the COVID experience. But for yeah. me, that's the, one of the most important is that just because institutions say they're um, committed to blended education or blended learning, that can mean many different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And we are not particularly happy with that. And I know EDTU and others have made efforts to better define that. And we might actually look at that in uh, for future surveys. Hybrid, we didn't have that on the radar when we did this. Uh, today, we would have asked that as well, because that becomes more and more um, the case that institutions offer basically students the opportunity either to have it online or um, to come to campus. I think what one has also to take into consideration that from some of the um, institutions and in particular from certain regions, in particular Eastern Europe, we also still get the message that they have some restrictions on uh, use of digitally enhanced learning. So uh, they are either, either it's not counted at all or it is, uh, you, you can only use it in small doses, so to say, homeopathically, then you get away with that. Um, but for example, I talked yesterday to Croatian colleagues and who said, as soon as they go over 50% online, uh, they have to re-accredit uh, the course as an, under a completely different process. Yes, Michael, if I just come in, Ireland is a little unique in the European context because uh, about four years ago, we developed some guidelines through the quality agency, QQI, for blended education. Yep. Um, but we're talking barriers in the poll at the moment. I think people have identified that can, you can actually only select one out of the options. So just select your top ah. barrier, then all three if you wash. But one of the barriers is that often institutions define academic workload or teaching workload by the hours of contact. And therefore, there's actually very little incentive to um, substitute face to face with a digital yeah. experience. And yeah. so more often what happens is that something is added on to what's already done. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was referring to to what extent is that really disruptive um, by truly changing the nature of the student yeah. experience. It was clearly disruptive in the crisis for colleagues, uh, for systems where you, students had to be physically on campus uh, to be counted as learners. So 
I go to the next slide then. Um, this is a bit about our strategy and governance. And what we found is compared to 2014, we have a relatively high increase in institutional strategies. So as opposite to no strategy or strategies uh, driven only by faculty, uh, at faculty level, or even, which we still had in 2014 and which has disappeared now, individual our staff of the university are in charge for the digitalization. So that doesn't exist apparently. Most institutions have some kind of a strategy. I think we had only 12% which hadn't. Uh, uh, related, I think, is that we also see an increase of centralized and shared responsibilities for uh, digitally enhanced learning. That doesn't mean that the whole teaching is managed top down, but that there, there are basically structures and resources which are managed and shared throughout the institution. And as you can see, that jumped up from 75% to 93. And that's the interesting part is we have here in the sample, we have some institutions which have a fairly decentralized governance uh, structure. So we still don't know what happened happened there? Have they recently moved to a more centralized governance structure altogether? Or do they basically just acknowledge the need to do that for digitally enhanced learning because it is so resource intensive, because it requires so much technology, technological environment, maintenance, and, and, and I mean, to put one example, you don't want to have 40 uh, different uh, content management systems being used at your institutions. But this is what we actually saw at some institutions. Any reflection from from Ireland on that? Uh, I, I think um, often these surveys raise as many questions as they do provide us with answers. But the the benchmarking, I think, is very interesting. Um, the greater commitment to strategy, I, I suspect, is going to be something we will continue to see in the post COVID nineteen experience. Um, for those of you who are in leadership roles, and by that I don't mean senior institutional roles because everyone at different levels can play a leadership role, there is a fundamental question when it comes to strategy about whether you need to have a separate standalone strategy. And this was something that we um, grappled with in the design of the survey. Um, for example, my own institution has chosen not to have a separate strategy, but infuse it or embed it into its existing strategies. So if you were to go to look for a strategy on blended education or digital learning, you won't find one, um, but it is there. And you could argue that that's a more mature approach. It depends, I think, very much on the culture of the institution, the type of leadership, but it is, pleasing to see the level of distributed leadership, I guess, is what I'm interpreting with the um, less centralized or the fact that there is more people engaged in the participation and governance, because uh, I would go back again through my own experience working with other institutions. It's too easy to think that all you need is a strategy and maybe someone to own the strategy, and then you can tick that yeah. box. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, our survey results are a little bit biased because they are provided by leadership, you know, and of course, leadership develop the strategies and also think that everybody embraces them. But it's good that you point on the stuff and stakeholder participation in governance of digitalization. That was a new question, 65%. We found that actually interesting. And I think that's also a good moment when I can share, I close the second poll now and I share the results of the first one. I hope you can see that. Can anybody see that? Not yet, huh? I'll try that again. No, they should normally be shared. Why can I not see them? Daniela, can you see them? Oh, and um, one, of the, one of the participants um, just wrote, they cannot see them either. Ah, okay. <laughs> I try that again, but it says here that I shared them. How do I do this? Maybe I have to change something here? Just as you're doing that, Michael, uh, I don't have the rights either to share them, but um, I think a related um, survey that we had in Ireland, the national survey, that issue of the extent with which um, people who are involved in teaching, but maybe not leadership roles, perceive a sense of agency in influencing mm -hmm. the policy and the strategy. Actually, that was quite low in Ireland. Um, so whilst most institutions have been mm. much more strategic 
it would appear that we haven't been as successful in engaging the whole community within the organization and beyond. Um, so there is some work to be done there, I think, still. Because we all know that if this strategy is not owned um, by everyone, then oh. it's not really likely to be successful. Yeah. Okay, then I just read out, I'm really sorry, but we are all newcomers on this tool and also the tech support didn't really know on how to do that. So I read you out the results. So we have 30, 32% for proactive participation of staff and students. Um, and uh, then the next one is professional development and training and then major investments in equipment and infrastructure. So these were the top three. And if you can bear that in mind, so participation of staff and students, professional development and major investments. And then with that, I go to my next slide um, where you can see the top enablers that we got out of our survey. And they that pretty much aligns, you know. Uh, so proactive participation of staff and students came out as really the number one enabler and professional development is the second one. And then uh, the third one, and here I said, it comes from, insti from, from institutional leadership, the strategies uh, came first, but the fourth one would have been indeed investments in uh, infrastructures and equipment. So um, uh, this aligns here. And uh, we also have a look then at the um, second, uh, at the barriers, and there it's uh, lack of staff resources, lack of external funding opportunities, um, difficulty to devise a concerted institutional approach. And I just check if, if I can show the results of the second poll here. <laughs> of course, even if I share them, you will not be able to see them. So I read them out for you. Difficulty to devise a concerted approach for the entire institution comes out first. So that's the highest, followed by uh, staff motivation is 28%. 20, staff motivation is actually the highest one. And then followed by um, the strategy or a concerted approach for the entire institution. And then the next one would have been lack of staff resources. Also there, I mean, I can see quite a similarity with the, it, it, it really aligns very much with what we found here, quite similar. What we found interesting about this, that was a survey on digitally enhanced uh, learning, but the um, enablers and the barriers, which are very much aligned, are actually about strategy, people and investment. So not about technologies. And then I have um, another point here, which is on measures. So we also asked uh, institutions, what does them actually help them in their situation? And there what you can see is clearly it's peer exchange within the institution. So somehow um, working across the compartmentalized structures, enabling people to work together and to exchange, and also national and international training opportunities. And the third one is then collection and analysis of institutional data. So have a kind of reality check what is really happening and being able then um, to uh, respond to that. So it's mainly peer exchange and collaboration, which is highlighted here. Again, nothing which is uh, very specific now for digitally enhanced learning. I could have probably run this also for uh, other issues like internationalization or learning and teaching in general. I think we get different, uh, similar uh, responses. Mark, any comments? Well, I think you made the important observation earlier that the survey um, required someone in the institution, a single uh, person, typically in a leadership role, to have responded. So when you talk about barriers and enablers, um, it's often useful to dis uh, differentiate between direct and indirect ones. Um, and then more importantly, probably is taking a sort of ecosystem approach or recognizing a macro, meso, micro, and even nano level barriers. Uh, the nano level being you, the individual. Um, mm -hmm. that, so the, the barriers will have a different flavor 
depending upon where you sit within your organization and, and the role you play. But having said that, I don't see any surprises here. Uh, we know that uh, professional development and training is still a major challenge, particularly impactful professional development that ultimately impacts the, the student experience um, so I, I think this reinforces that there's still a reasonable amount of work to be done. Perhaps the only other thing I would say, uh, and again, it depends on your um, position and perspective, often in addition to enablers, um, I think Stephen Downs is the author of this, um, the sometimes language of attractors. Um, one attracts you and another is an enabler. Um, so an attractor might be the opportunity to earn external income. Um, because of a new initiative. And so that might be an attractor for someone in a senior leadership role, but it may have no bearing on someone who's doing the key-based teaching, if you like. So again, context is important. Right, yeah. I just see here in the slide, actually, um, that a colleague from Bremer Hafen shared that um, they had a uh, blended learning approach, which was basically came from a professor um, who had a view on how to improve this and it, um, and that it actually never comes from the top of the institution and that there is no view on education innovation. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, from all what I have seen in my daughter and Mark may comment on that from institutional practice, that's what we also see. And um, the innovation comes from staff and students, uh, but not from the institutional leadership. Um, but we see an important role of the institutional leadership to ensure um, that these are, are innovative approaches are actually taken up, uh, matured, uh, mainstreamed, and also properly resourced. Michael, there's a, um, a body of literature that also talks about the importance of middle out. So if we were distinguishing here between uh, bottom up uh, and top down, um, the role of the middle out is very important in this context. And what I mean by that are um, centers for teaching and learning. Um, there's mm. other surveys that have shown how those sorts of centers um, do play a role. Um, they're a bit of the glue that connects up the faculty staff with the, the central leadership yeah. team. Um, but I absolutely agree um, about the importance of effectively winning hearts and minds and the engine room of innovation coming from the, the, the real core of the university or institution you're working in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And there's another comment which makes the point that uh, the div how to understand the difficulty uh, to devise a concerted institutional approach. But I think it's exactly like you uh, uh, proposed it here. During the pandemic, you were under the pressure to do that. We know that a lot of it has been enabled by individual teachers and uh, students, but that's actually not a good approach and runs risk of putting too much burden on their shoulders. So they actually need the uh, uh, structures and support to uh, be resilient in such kinds of situations. I'm moving on to our, that's actually the last slide now, and we are actually already in the discussion, Corona Beyond towards a new normal. Um, when we asked the institutions in May and June, they were, uh, I think, still partly under shock. Some came back and triumphed and said, we found ways, you know, it was terrible the first two weeks, but now we are running it and it's not ideal, but it works actually quite well. So what we have seen, of course, 90% had pivoted uh, to remote emergency, as it is often called, but also student surveys showed that uh, the dissatisfaction, I mean, there was, of course, dissatisfaction and it was not ideal. And there's also, was also, uh, it made certain digital divides and also how your social impact uh, can impact, uh, your, your social background can impact your access to education uh, comes to play. But overall, it seemed to have worked about all right, but we are now going into a new phase. Uh, uh, the pandemic continues and institutions will have to, have to find ways of how to deal with that. Some institutions, some of the things that the institutions indicated already uh, in the survey was that they want to enhance existing structures. So 90% indicated that they offered already online library access, but of these 
65% said that it has to be enhanced. So clearly in the stress test of the pandemic, what they offered there was not enough or not good enough. And three quarter also said that they had concrete plans to enhance digital capacity. And uh, practically all said they had to explore new ways of teaching. Of course you had, but we also have some anecdotal, anecdotal, uh, anecdotal evidence of institutions which really started to rethink their curricula, not only in view of the current crisis, uh, but also in the future in view of more flexible and better quality uh, provision in the future. And they also involved, to quote one example, um, they involved, for example, students in that as course and curriculum designer and also as um, testers of courses and of um, assessments. Um, any views on that, Mark? Of course you have. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have to have. Uh, very, very um, interesting to see the number of institutions reporting they are going to look at new ways of teaching. Of course, look at new ways of teaching is not the same as embrace new ways of teaching. And I, I guess we're into speculative territory when we start talking about post-COVID. But I, I do believe that there are going to be some very important legacies. In fact, what we're doing right now um, as a form of professional development, um, there are just many more opportunities um, at less cost, I should add, in all sorts of ways, including the carbon footprint that's been monitored. Uh, one other observation I would make, and there's a comment in the chat box about this, is the, the pressure that has been placed on those people that we've said who are the real engine room of innovation. Um, in the COVID experience. And I think it doesn't necessarily show up in this survey yet, but it's showing up all over the place that uh, there's a greater recognition of the emotions and the effective side of learning. And that's not just for our teachers, our instructors, but I also think for our learners. Mm -hmm. So um, it'll be interesting how we blend, if you like, using blend in a slightly different way, uh, the technology with the emotional aspect of learning um, going forward. Okay, what what uh, that's interesting, and I think that's also what we heard, and also that the you become much more aware also of the whole social background of your students and the conditions under which they learn, taking also into consideration that a good part of the learning takes actually place off campus. Um, one one concern is there now a concern that there is a kind of backlash on digitally enhanced learning. I mean that as many colleagues may have felt. I mean, we're talking to the people who were, see that actually as an opportunity, who triumph and say, we made more progress than before in four years or so. Uh, but there are a lot of colleagues who probably don't feel really comfortable with it and want to go back uh, to campus as soon as possible. So is there a risk that we brand now um, digitally enhanced learning as a kind of emergency mood? Uh, and as soon as you can, you go back to campus and you fall back into the old ways of, of doing it? Well, I'm thinking with an eye on the time, Michael, that's a, a great question probably to end with. Um, people ah. may have their own responses, but um, who knows? I'm sure yeah. there are some people longing to go back to the way things were. Um, and I guess my final observation would be, um, borrowing a cliche in some respects or a slogan, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. So we can have all the new strategies and plans uh, post COVID-19 mm. for new ways of teaching, but whether your institutional culture will enable those will, will be very important to, uh, in terms of the outcome. Well, thanks so much. And I think I, I fully agree on that. And we also see that there is a lot of awareness for that. Hence the emphasis on participatory approaches involving staff and students. I think the great, the, the hundred dollar question here is how do you actually do that? You know, um, so, okay, we are coming to an end. So thanks Mark and thanks Daniela for supporting us. And thanks to all of you for being here and participating actively and sorry for the glitch with the polls. Maybe we can share them in another way. We try to get them to you. Thanks. Yeah, well, there was actually a question if the slides will be shared too. And I can let you know that we will um, have on our website um, after the festival all the information about the different sessions. So you can actually get this information afterwards. Great. Thanks so much.